such an honor to have Larry Lessig back with us. Uh, Larry keynoted at, I think, the third annual Open Education Conference, and we were still having it up in Logan, Utah. Um, and Okay, this is why I wrote notes, because I'll actually get emotional if I start just talking about Larry. Um, Larry is the Royal, Roy L. Furman Professor of Law and Leadership at Harvard Law School and Director of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University. Uh, prior to rejoining the Harvard faculty, Larry was a professor at Stanford Law School where he founded the Center for Internet and Society. Uh, he has clerked for Justice Scalia on the U.S. Supreme Court uh, and received countless rewards including the Free Software Foundation's Freedom Award. You might not have known all of that about him. You know him as the founder of Creative Commons that provides the licenses that enable all of the work that we do in the open education space. So I am so humbled and so honored to introduce to you Larry Lessig. Please help me welcome him to the stage. So thank you, Dave. Um, it's incredibly fun to be back, although I've got to say that I prefer Utah over Washington. Um, um, I'm hoping you won't give up the idea of Utah in the future. I'm sorry. I usually don't have any technical problems at all. I don't know what happens to my technical skills here. There we go. OK. Um, so nobody has the power to get me to talk about copyright issues anymore, except Dave Wiley. Um, and when I was thinking about this idea of coming and talking to you about these issues again, I was looking back at this period of my life, which was a long, happy, not so happy period of my life, and I recognized that the great thing about what you do is that you work in a space where there is both good parts and difficult parts, creative parts and depressing parts, parts where people do things, create amazing applications or uh, educational material or uh, sites that organize and celebrate, as well as stop people through the ways in which the law interferes with this creativity. It was the good and the bad together. And as I thought about it like that, I realized that for me, uh, a symbolic moment, figure, in that way of thinking about this stage was um, somebody I know a lot of you knew as well, a friend, um, Aaron Swartz. Because Aaron Swartz was, for me and for many of us, uh, an organizer, an idealist, an inspiration. He was, at the beginning of Creative Commons, an organizer, an idealist, an inspiration. Creative Commons, of course, an organization which I didn't found, I helped found. There were many who helped push this into life, but the person who made it real, who wanted to make it practical, was Aaron. We talked about the ideals of what Creative Commons would do, but Aaron was the technical architect. And when we launched Creative Commons, he was insistent that we focus on the practical, technical features of Creative Commons. He insisted so strongly that we asked him to step up on stage to introduce Creative Commons, and, and here he was. Well, thanks. Now that you've seen the theory behind Creative Commons, it's time to show you some of the practice. So when you come to, your, come to our website here, you want to show you the practice. You want to choose license. Structure that it gives you this list of options. And that was the way he was in everything he did, which was grabbing the theoretical and making it practical. And for many years, we worked together. But then about eight years ago, he came to me and he asked me a question. <clears throat> I was eager to share with him the work that I was doing preparing my first great TED talk. This was Fat Larry. So um, 
I was going to give a talk at TED, my first talk about the laws that show creativity, what a title that was, and I was eager that he see the ideas that I was putting together, and I shared with him a little bit of the outline for the talk, and he was a little impatient with the theory, and he wanted to talk about the practice. practice. And he said to me, so how do you think you're ever going to achieve the things you're fighting for? changes in the way copyright law regulate the creative process so long as we have this basic corruption in the way our government functions. And I was a little miffed with that question. I was eager for him to be excited about my laws that show creativity talk. Um, so I pushed back a bit and I said to him, you know, Aaron, it's not my field, <laughs> not my field. And he said, you mean as an academic, it's not your field? I said, yes, as an academic, it's not my field. He said, okay, fine, but what about as a citizen? Is it your field as a citizen? And this was the way Aaron was. His questions spoke as clearly as a child's hug. And from that moment, from that moment, I took up the challenge. And I agreed that the next chunk of my life would be work on this problem, this problem of this corruption, this problem that was central, not just to the problems of copyright, but to every other problem. But as I look back on this, I realized that when I did that, I gave up the hopeful part, and now I live in just the depressing part. <laughs> as I've continued the work which he set me on. And of course, I've written books and I've given hundreds, literally hundreds of talks, first aiming to understand this problem, but then in an errant way to understand how to respond to this problem. So I want to share with you a little bit about how we should understand it first on the way to recruiting you the challenge of how we should take it on. So how to understand it. So I'm going to give you something, a gift. I'm going to give you one word that you can use to understand exactly what the problem with our government is. A single word. The word is tweedism. Tweedism. Inspired by the Cherry Street philosopher Boss Tweed, who used to say, I don't care who does the electing as long as I get to do the nominating. Now that idea we're going to call tweedism and it formalizes. It's like this. There's a two-stage process, or you could say an end-stage process, where in the first stage, the tweeds get to do the selecting that then sets up the candidates who the rest of us get to do the electing. And there's a filter in the middle. And the question that we ask when we look at democracies or any form of government and observe it to be a tweedist government is, is that filter in some sense biased? So when you think about tweedism around the world, there are lots of examples. Think about the old Soviet Union, right? The Soviet Union was, they said, a democracy because they had an election, an election where all citizens got to vote. But of course, before they had that election, the Politburo, where the commies got to vote, chose the candidates who would run in the election. So to run in the election, you had to do well in the Politburo, a two-stage process, a tweedist process where 19 people got to pick the candidates the 270 million people would be governed by. Now, when the Soviet Union said, this is a democracy, we said, come on, that's absurd. <laughs> that's not a democracy. Nothing to do with what a democracy is. But we should, of course, be a little bit reflective before we insist on the absurdity of calling that a democracy. Because think about democracy in America. Think about tweedism in America. In the old South in America, 1870, we did something nobody thought we would do. We ratified an amendment to the Constitution that said African Americans could not be denied the right to vote on the basis of their race. And when they did that in 1870, most thought the future would look something like this, but in fact, the future instead looked like this, not a future of equality and a future of exclusion. For a hundred years, okay, it's a little bit of exaggeration. For 95 years, there was a concerted effort by 
the South to exclude African Americans from participating in the political process, no place more ambitiously than the great state of Texas, which by law had an all-white primary. It said only whites could vote in the Democratic primary. So in the Old South, there was a general election where all citizens got to vote, but before that, there was a white primary where only whites got to vote. And you had to do well in the white primary to be able to run in the general election, a two-stage process which excluded, at the critical first stage, African Americans from participating, a significant minority of America. And the consequence, of course, obviously, was a democracy responsive to whites only. Now, this idea of tweetism is particularly salient right now across the world. Think about what's going on in Hong Kong incredible protests all across Hong Kong that stopped the government um, and forced them into this process of rethinking the, the future. I want you to see that these two are protests against tweedism. Right, because what China said in 2007 was that there would be a democracy in Hong Kong. By 2017, the governor, the chief executive, would be elected in Hong Kong. But in August, they described how that election process would work. They said the ultimate aim is the selection of a chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. That committee, 1,200 citizens, means about 0.024% of Hong Kong would do the nominating of the candidates who got to run in the election. So Hong Kong, too, has an election. All citizens would vote. But the nominations would be done by the 1,200. You had to do well in the nominating committee to be able to run in the election, a two-stage process, with this filter defining it as tweedism, which triggered the strike across the country. Because the claim was that filter was biased. As the democracy forces argued, the 1,200 were dominated by a pro-Beijing business and political elite. As Martin Lee, the chairman of the Hong Kong Democratic Party, put it, we want a genuine universal suffrage, not democracy with Chinese characteristics. But the point I want you to see is it's not really Chinese characteristics that defines what Hong Kong was offering. It's increasingly universal, modern, obvious, and we should think a little bit about whether it applies here, too. Because we take for granted in America, campaigns are privately funded. And funding, of course, is essential to the process of getting elected. So there's a two-stage process, we could think, about getting elected in America. The first is funding, getting the money you need to run. And the second is running, getting the votes you need to be elected. Now, to run in America, candidates and members of Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising the money they need to get to Congress or to get their party back into power, dialing for dollars to get the resources they need to run. B.S. Skinner gave us this image of the Skinner box, where any stupid animal could learn which buttons it needed to push to get the sustenance it needs to survive. This is the picture of the modern American congressperson. <laughs> As the modern American congressperson learns which buttons he or she must push in order to survive, as any of us would, they develop in this process a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do will affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shapeshifters as they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat for Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. And to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> so as we think about this process of calling for 30 to 70% of the time, we need to think about who are the funders? Who are the people that are being called? And the reality is, at most, it's not as bad as Hong Kong, 0.024%. At most, in America, it's 0.05% of America who's being called. These are the relevant funders, the people who give enough to matter. About 150,000 Americans, which the internet tells me is the same number of people as are named Lester, which is why I called this in my TED talk Lesterland. And after the Supreme Court's decision in McCutcheon, that number is going to fall, I think, to no more than 35,000, which turns out to be the same number of people as are named Sheldon in the United States. 
Or think about the super PAC created in 2010 by the DC Circuit. In 2012, 132 Americans gave 60% of the money that went to those super PACs. That's about the same number of people as are named Adolf in the United States. So whether it's Leicester Land or Sheldon City or Adolphia, the point is it is a tiny, tiny fraction of the 1% that dominate this critical first stage of our democracy. So we too have a two-stage democracy. In the second stage, all citizens get to vote. If you're over 18, in some states if you have an ID. But in the first stage, we don't have a white primary. We have a green primary, a green primary. And you must do well in the green primary in order to run in the general election. You don't necessarily have to win. There is Jerry Brown. But the point is most campaign managers tell their candidates, we must win the green primary. You must work to win the green primary if we're going to have a shot in the general election. But in this tweetist democracy, it's not a minority that's being excluded. It is the majority, the vast majority, excluded from this critical first step. And the consequence is to produce this democracy responsive to the funders only. It's an incredible study by Princeton, but I'm not allowed to talk about Princeton studies, so I put that off the stage really quickly, <laughs> by Martin Gillens and Ben Page. The largest empirical study of policy decisions, actual policy decisions by our government in the history of political science, relating what our government did to the, to the views of the economic elite, organized interests, and the average voter. So the economic elite, this graph, pretty obvious, right? So from the left to the right is the percentage of the economic elite who support a policy. And going up is the probability the policy gets passed. So as more support the policy from the economic elite, the probability of it being passed goes up. Same with organized interest. As the, probability, as the percentage or the number of these organized interest groups support something, the probability of it passing goes up. Here's the vote for the average citizen. That's called a flat line. <laughs> flat line. What that says is, Regardless of the percentage of average citizens who support something, it doesn't affect the probability that it will be passed. It's only if we happen to agree with what the economic elite want that you're going to see that going up. The average voter has no statistical effect on the actual policies that our government passes. In English, this is what they summarize. When the preferences of the economic elites, stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy. They call this a democracy. But this is what the numbers show. And we can see it over time. Here's an incredible graph by um, Professor Chernova uh, at Bard College. So this is distribution of average income growth. I'm going to give you one example to make clear what this is showing. The blue bar shows you the percentage of the average income growth during a recovery that went to the bottom 90%. And the red bar is the percentage that went to the top 10%. So right here, you could say, well, the bottom 90% got 80% of the average income growth. The top 10% got 20%. You, think, you might think that's good or bad, whatever, but that's where we start in 1949 to 1953. Here's how it goes over time. So that in the last cycle, the percentage taken by the top 10% is greater than 100%. <laughs> They're collecting from earlier cycles to get more than 100%, and the bottom blue bar is the bottom 90% who get less after this cycle than they, had did, they did before. Now, this graph has been challenged. Forbes magazine challenged it. Surprise, surprise. But the basic lesson here is absolutely established, that there is a point in our history recently, in the 1970s, mid-1970s, where the division of rewards in our economy splits, no longer going to everybody, but increasingly going to the top, top slice of America. And as Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson put it in their incredibly important book, the reason for this shift is changes in government policy. Changes in government policy. And the reason for changes in government policy is the lesson Boss Tweed taught us 
or that 100 years ago. Now, of course, this is not the tweetism of Hong Kong. It's not a pro-Beijing business and political elite. It's just a business and economic elite, no pro-Beijing involved. But that's the reality of the democracy we now have. It is just as extreme as the Beijing. 0.05% is those who give just $2,500. 0.01% is those who give $10,000 or more. So you tell me what you think a significant amount is to be relevant. But the point is it's just as wrong to the ideals of a democracy. Now, what's the consequence of this? What does it do? So I became focused on this problem in the context of copyright. I became convinced that copyright was out of tune on October 27th, 1998. That was a day, some might remember, when Congress passed and the President signed a law in honor of this great American the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, an act which extended the term of existing copyrights by 20 years. Now, the question Congress was to be asking when it passed this statute was, did it advance the public good to extend the term of an existing copyright by 20 years? Uh, when we took this case to the Supreme Court challenging this extension, we had a brief signed by a bunch of economists, including five Nobel Prize winners, including this left-wing, oh, I'm sorry, this is right-wing Milton Friedman, Nobel Prize winning economist, who said he would only sign the brief, arguing that it didn't advance the public good to extend the term of an existing copyright if the word no-brainer was somewhere in the brief. <laughs> so obvious was it that you couldn't advance the public good by extending the reward for already created works. But apparently there were no brains in this place when Congress unanimously passed the extension of existing copyrights. What there was was more than $6 million from Disney and related corporations eager to fight to extend the term of existing copyright. Now that was the 90s and the early 2000s, but many of us, including Aaron, believe that when this man came to office, things would change. And in important ways, it did. For the issues you care about most, open education, the Obama administration has been an incredibly important change. Pushing for the idea of freely licensed material because of incredible people like Hal Plotkin in the middle of that government pushing to make this make sense. But in the broad sweep of policies affecting copyright, like so much of the Obama administration, it was the same but only worse than what had happened before. Washington Post describes what they think of as a source of this continued distortion. Here's why Obama trade negotiators pushed the interests of Hollywood and drug companies. One picture, the revolving door, they say. Because as they observe, so many people from the US Trade Office spin from the US Trade Office into these private spaces. So as the article says, since the turn of the century, at least a dozen US Trade Representative officials have taken jobs with pharmaceutical companies, filmmakers, record labels, and technology companies in favor of stronger patent and copyright protections. As, J as Jamie Love puts it, what's the next job that everyone at USTR has? It's working for some industry or trade group. And the claim of this article is that the consequence of this is that the United States pushes on the rest of the world a particularly extreme version of copyright. It's not the American version of copyright. It's the American version tweaked to be more extreme. As they say, it's a bit of a funhouse mirror of American copyright law. Not all provisions of US law are exported with equal enthusiasm. When it comes to provisions of US law that are favorable to rights holders, American negotiators have fought to require other countries to ape US law in great detail. But when it limits copyright or patent holders' rights, the language favored by the US tends to be more abstract and open-ended. The limits, fair use or limits about the ability to import reimportation are removed while the protections are reinforced. And no place is more extreme to me, kind of crazy to me, than this fight over what's called the temporary copy. Right, copyright law regulates what we think of as copies. 
But we should remember there's a history to copyright law which made that regulation relatively benign. This is from my book published 10 years ago now, Fair, uh, Free Culture. If you think about all the uses of copyright, copyrighted work, think of a book. In physical space, a significant chunk of those uses are just technically unregulated. Right, so you do read a book. It's not a fair use of the book, it's a free use of the book. Because to read a book is not to produce a copy. To give someone a book is not a fair use of the book, it's a free use. Because to give somebody a book is not to produce a copy. To sell a book is explicitly exempted after the first sale from the regulation of copyright law. It's not a fair use, it's a free use. To sleep on a book, totally permitted in every jurisdiction around the world, without triggering copyright law, because there is no copy produced. The point is, these are unregulated uses. And then at the core, there's a set of regulated uses, regulated to create the incentives for authors to produce great new work. And then in the American tradition, there's this thin sliver of exceptions to those regulated uses, things called fair uses, uses which otherwise would have been regulated, but for the protections of fair use that exempt that regulation. So the point is there's a balance between regulated and unregulated uses in the physical space. Even though copyright law was triggered on the production of a copy, that was the reality in physical space. Okay, but enter digital, where everything you do produces a copy, and all of a sudden the copyright lawyers say, oh, we have a new presumption here. Everything you do is presumptively regulated. Presumptively regulated. Even though it was not always so, that's, that's what copyright law tried to do. Copyright didn't even regulate copies for the whole history of copyright law. As the 1790 statute said, the sole right of liberty of printing, reprinting, publishing, and vending. Then in 1909, the word copy was inserted but in 1909, nobody was thinking about computers or even Xerox machines, as uh, Lyman Ray Patterson, the great, one of the greatest copyright scholars um, in our history, puts it. In fact, it was probably a mistake that the word copy was inserted there, because it was referring to a different idea with respect to um, statues. So the point is, it's a mistake to insert it, but once it's inserted, the lawyers grab that word and they say, anytime you've got a copy, we've got a trigger of copyright law, and therefore the application of copyright law, and therefore, do you have a license for what you're doing, even if the copy is temporary? Meaning, you send an email with an co image from your computer to somebody else's, and it passes through 30 servers on the way, each one of those temporary copies under this extreme version of copyright law triggers copyright law and you have to ask, are they all licensed? Now most people through the two, two, 2000s thought this was just an absurd position to take and that the law should at least back away from this. But this too, Obama is pushing in the latest negotiations. The temporary copy do trigger copyright law even though no court, no Supreme Court decision yet has authorized this as even the interpretation of American law. Now the point is the law here is constantly bending towards Hollywood, not because of the revolving door. It's bending towards Hollywood because of a reality that everyone gets. After Aaron and his army stopped SOPA, Chris Dodd, who is now the chairman of the MPAA, was a big famous senator from Connecticut who promised when he left the Senate he would not become a lobbyist. And he insists he's not a lobbyist, he's just the head of the biggest lobbying organization for Hollywood. When he was so furious about the defeat of SOPA, he got on television and said, you know, these politicians need to recognize if they want us, they need to help us. And people said, oh, it's grotesque, the idea that he would so explicitly say that in exchange for passing legislation, Hollywood would be giving money. That's just not done. Nobody would do something like that. But of course, everybody knew it was true. He had just over, he had overstated, he had been too transparent about this reality. That's what's true. And what that means is that especially a democratic administration is going to be incredibly sensitive to how what it does affects the interest of those who fund it so dramatically. And that's, in fact, what Hollywood does. Now, but what's interesting is it's not always true with respect to copyright issues, especially the issues you care most about right now. I'm sure many of you were uh, aware of the fight that was uh, involved with the question raised in the 2012 Appropriations Act of whether uh, the Department of Labor 
could deliver on its promise to require that the $500 million it was spending for open education resource material be CC by licensed. And there's this provision, section 124, that was part of the bill for a while that said that uh, basically the department had to make an evaluation of whether any of the material it was commissioning would conflict with any material that actually existed out there or any material that was in the process of being created out there by a proprietary company. And if it would conflict, they couldn't support it, which would basically mean there would be no open education material supported because these companies would say, no, 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 we're going to do that. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. Of course, we're going to charge lots of money for it, and you don't have any rights over it, but we're going to do that. So this would have killed open education in the context of that incredible spending that the Department of Labor did. But after the National Review <laughs> raised a problem with this idea, namely that homeschoolers would not be able to take advantage of this material, they quickly backed off. And this provision disappeared from the law, and so the restriction on open education was not yet implemented. So, why, so what is this? Is this a proof that the system is not as powerful or corrupted as Aaron and others and I have worried? I think it's proof that you're not yet big enough, important enough, to threaten them enough that they deploy their power powerfully enough against what you're trying to do. But just you wait. <laughs> Just you wait, because here too, the, or, the interests are organizing effectively to push back against what this incredibly important movement is doing. Now, when you experience this, when you watch, as we did in the open, uh, in the in the free culture movement, the defeats, the defeats, the defeats. It's 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 natural to think, you know, this is just something about us, you know, something about what we want. They're against us. But the important thing to recognize is this is not just about you. There's equal opportunity crazy here when we think about policies our government does or doesn't adopt. And that's because of something fundamental about what's happened that I've described, right? You can think about our government as a representative democracy, not a pure democracy, a complicated democracy. So think about it as kind of the Swiss watch of democracies, all these systems of checks and balances built in by our framers. But what we've done is we've allowed honey to be poured in the middle of that Swiss watch. And as your intuition suggests, when that happens, that stops the ability of this system to function in any rational way because of the system of funding elections. Because what this means, what this tiny fraction of the 1% means is that a tiny number of them really a tiny, tiny number, that's as small as I could make it, <laughs> have the ability to block sensible reform. And what that means is that change, whether it's change of any kind, whether it's from the left or the right, or from the sensible middle, will fail because there's such an easy opportunity to block that kind of reform, that change including your kind of change. Francis Fukuyama describes the United States as a vetocracy, as in veto, a vetoocracy. Because what he says is we've developed a government, it's trivially easy now to block any change because of the extreme funding we've allowed to be concentrated in these large funders. And what that means is sane policy, not just about copyright, is not possible until we change how campaigns are funded. We are like the bus driver who has lost the ability to steer the bus. It's been disconnected because our part, the democracy part, is not the part that matters. Now this is a story about power. It's not about persuasion. It's about changing power, not just about becoming more persuasive. All right, so then what's the solution? The solution, the obvious solution here is, right, we've got to change the way campaigns are funded. We've got to spread it so it's not just the 0.05% who are funding, but it's a vast majority of people who are funding. To spread out the funder interest so that it's not just the tweeds who are funding the campaigns. And to do this, what we need to do is simply pass one statute, one statute that would decentralize campaign funding. This is the, metaphor, this is the thing you've got to keep in your head. Centralized system versus a decentralized system. 
a system where one or two people are powerful or the people, a system where lots of people are powerful. And there are lots of ways to decentralize the funding. There are matching fund proposals. John Sarbanes' Governed by the People Act would make it so small contributions get matched up to nine to one, so you can afford to run winning campaigns taking small contributions only. Republicans push the idea of vouchers. Everybody gets a small voucher, maybe 50, maybe 100, maybe $200, which they use to fund campaigns. The point is both of these systems would decentralize the funding of campaigns, making politicians responsive to the many rather than responsive to the few. Both of them would kill the effective veto that is in our system today. This is the obvious and first answer that we as a democracy should be rallying around. So why don't we do it? What explains the failure we have had again and again? Why is there no solution to this problem? Well, if you talk to the pundits, especially in the Beltway, they say, you know, the people don't care. People don't care about this. I ran a group called Mayday, which was trying to um, elect people uh, to Congress um, uh, through campaigns focused on this issue. Our objective was to try to demonstrate that, in fact, this issue could move voters. Of course, we got caught up in the tsunami, which was the 2014 election. But the point is, we were focused on this and getting people to talk about it. When we didn't elect the candidates, there was some pretty nasty press out there. Politico kind of gloated on the failure that we had had. They referred to me as a egghead. Um, and the Rick Wilson, this is, his name's Rick Wilson, but his Twitter handle is the Rick Wilson, um, had this quote at the end of this article. It's a zero issue, campaign finance. No one cares, they shrug, they already believe that all politicians are corrupt assholes. It's baked into the cake, they get it. They get it. Now, I'm oh, sorry. I just have to take a costume change because with you I can be a little bit <laughs> Obviously, I'm an egghead. There's no doubt about that part. So this part of the story is completely true, and I don't mean to deny that at all. But here's the thing. Can I take this off now? You're just... <laughs> here's the thing that Rick Wilson confuses. The question is not, do they get it? The people, do they get it? We get it. We all get it. The question is, will we do something about it? And when we don't do something about it, it's not because we like it. We did a poll last year asking, how important is it to you that the influence of money in politics be reduced? The answer was 96% of Americans said it was important. It's not because we like it. It's because we're resigned to it. The next question on that poll was, how likely is it that the influence of money in politics will be reduced? 91% said, not likely. We resign ourselves to this system. So just like most of us, at least 96% of us, wish we could fly like Superman, because 91% are pretty confident we don't. We don't leap off of tall buildings regularly. This is just what it means to grow up, to accept the realities of modern life. So we've tweaked a bit Ben Franklin's slogan, nothing is certain but death and taxes, and a corrupt government. These are the truths of modern reality. But that forces us to answer, to think about the question Aaron forced me to think about. How do we resist this resign? How do we resist it? How do we push back against resign? And I think there are three steps. First is to talk about feasible change. There's a big movement to amend the Constitution. And that's an exciting movement because it rallies people to this cause. But then most of the people who get rallied think, whoa, whoa wait. <laughs> Amend the Constitution? That's not going to happen. So I'm going to go back to TV. Right? Because if you don't think it's possible, why get involved? So we've got to focus on feasible change. And that's why we need to think about a statute first. A statute like what I was describing, the decentralized funding, which would radically change the influence of the big funders in Washington. Second, we need to focus on ideals that inspire people here. Ideals about who we are. The sort of language that this boy pushed, the sort of thing that motivated him to do the dumbest thing he ever did, to download academic material, presumptively to make it openly accessible to the rest of the world. But most important for you is we have to way, find a way to teach, to teach this. 
And it's here that I come to recruit you. Now, I don't mean to recruit you the way Aaron recruited me, to give up what you're doing and focus only on this. Not that much, because that would be too much. What you're doing is extremely important. And what you're pushing is incredibly valuable to many, many causes, not just obviously the cause of reforming the law of copyright. So I don't want all of your time. I want at least a tenth of your time. I want you to tithe. I want you to tithe for this wrong. 10% of your efforts, your cycles, have got to be focused on this underlying problem. Because if you're going to make the world better, we have to first make it possible to make the world better. And the critical thing we need to recognize and talk about openly is the only way we're going to do that, the first step to doing that, not the last step, but the first step, is to change the way these campaigns are funded. And this is one more point before we stop here. So as I thought about coming back and talking to you, I thought about how this movement is an inspiration to me. Because against all odds, against an incredible amount of money, you're fighting for something that makes sense, something important and something that makes sense. Now, that's not to say that many in this movement are optimistic that we're going to change things dramatically anytime soon. But I think what we need to rediscover to talk about is not how we have to be optimistic, but we need to rediscover a special, different sense of the word hope. I don't mean the kind of abused and somewhat hopeless sense of our friend, the President, Barack Obama. I mean a sense of hope given to us by a different president, Vaclav Havel. This is what hope was for Vaclav Havel. Havel wrote this. Hope is a state of mind, not of the world. It is a dimension of the soul. It is not prognostication. It is an orientation of the spirit and an orientation of the heart. Hope is not the same as joy, that things are going well, or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously heading for success, but rather an ability to work for something because it is good. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense. Now, the truth is something does make sense here. I think this republic makes sense. I think what the ideals it has come to embrace after generations of fighting for it makes sense. But what you're fighting for, too, makes sense here. So you need to fight for what would make your sensible idea possible in this sensible republic, what would make your sensible idea possible to make it possible for this obviousness to become part of culture and of law. And to do that, you need to learn, as the title mysteriously suggested, to walk while chewing gum and maybe tweeting at the same time, <clears throat> which means you've got to give me at least 10% of your cycles. Thank you very much. So I'm happy, thank you. I'm happy to take questions. I've been told I should take questions. I'm a law professor, so I cold call on people. So if you don't <laughs> have any right away. Yes. So um, uh, my thought was on, on your uh, first point that as educators, and maybe that's an assumption, that my first shot is trying to educate the 20-year-old brains to think a little bit critically in our world today so that I can potentially, possibly, actually change the things you're talking about. I think that's, a, that's exactly right. And it's part of what is so inspiring to me about the Hong Kong story. Because remember, 
the people who showed up first in Hong Kong streets were kids. Literally, there were elementary school students among the other students who sat down in that protest. And it was then the parents who kind of felt embarrassed <laughs> that they were letting the kids do all the work. And then the Occupy Central showed up and turned it into the incredible protest it was. Um, so you've got to find a way to give kids motivation here. And part of what might motivate them is to get them to recognize the way in which every problem, every serious problem we're talking about is a problem that's going to affect them, not us, really. You know, you think about climate change. Like, you know, it's a bad problem, but it's not going to really matter to me, right? 50 years old, 53 years old, I'm going to be long gone before it matters. It's going to matter to them. The debt, literally borrowing from them, will be long gone before they find a way to deal with that problem. The economy that doesn't grow for that, you know, we're, I, you know, I, people of my age, you know, kind of settled. Things are going to be okay. But for them, this is devastating, right? Or the opportunities to create in a way that's not regulated insanely by the law. These are problems I don't suffer, but it's their way of living. Right? The point is to get them to recognize that each of these issues is about them first. We've broken the democracy and it hurts them. And then maybe there's a motivation and begin to think about an opportunity, a way to, for them to step up and do something about it. I, only, I think that's the only way this works. It's only ever worked like that, and it will only work this way. Because for us, it's easy for us just to sit, to sit this one out, because it's really hard for us to imagine how to fix it. Yeah? Uh, I love the Sony, Sony Bono photo. Uh, and of course, we all know how important pop music is for the preservation of humankind. But getting back to uh, your large framework that you presented, uh, where in there does, is there protection for, uh, you know, artists beyond, uh, you know, copyright law that's already been stated? And an example, you could look to China or you could look to Vietnam where uh, there is basically no copyright law. And original creative artists in those countries basically don't exist. Why? Because when they produce something, it's being sold on the street one week later for a dollar. So this is a really important point. Um, the way this debate was characterized for much of the history of the debate, it was as if it was a fight between those who believed in copyright and those who opposed copyright. Right? And part of what Creative Commons was trying to do was to show, no, no, no there's a really important space in the middle people who believe in copyright, but also believe that as artists, they, or creators, they want people to share or build upon their creativity in ways different from the kind of Hollywood all rights reserved model. And that move was originally, you know, intended to be just a kind of thought experiment. Then people like Aaron came along and turned it into something real. But the point was, it was to get people to recognize what is in some sense obvious, right, of course. But then what that points to is the recognition that what we need is not to abolish copyright, but to update it into a digital world to make it make sense of the objective of giving support to artists and creators that they need um, without being insane, which is what it is right now when it tries to purports to regulate every single copy. So it's an invitation, it's a, it's a command that we've got to find a way to make it make sense in the 21st century. And my point, you know, dumping on Obama's administration here, is that in the one place we thought there was an opportunity to begin to have that conversation, they haven't had that conversation. They're talking about how do we double down on making the 19th, 18th, 17th century copyright law forced on top of 21st century technology. The temporary copy is just the extreme, most extreme example of this. And instead of having that, you know, we ought to be engaging in the kind of conversation that people like Pam Samuelson or um, others in this debate have been having about how do we update the system to make it make sense in the 21st century. And your question is exactly the key question here. How do we make sure artists get compensated? But there's two questions here. How do we make sure artists get compensated? But how do we also make sure that the law doesn't over-regulate so that people who want to share and build upon creativity consistent with what the artist wants don't find themselves felons or don't 
need to turn their students into felons when they want them to engage in that kind of creativity too. Yeah. Um, as you know, the European Commission has been towards upper reform of the last month, which is potentially exciting. Uh, and my question is, should we focus in Brussels on harmonizing exception implications, or should we push for more radical uh, reduction of the term of objection? Yeah, I think you need to walk and chew gum <laughs> here, too. I think we need to do both. Yeah. Um, and you're right. I mean, you know, what's striking is countries like Britain you know, which have had a series of major reports, Hargreaves reports, the most recent, which have been really critical um, reports on the nature of copyright and the role um, and the important um, need for updating copyright and certain clear principles like never extend the term of existing copyright. Um, but even there, the Hargreaves report reports on how American companies went and tried to lobby them to back off of some of these sensible positions. So it's interesting, in other countries, they don't have the same perversion that we have in this country because of, you know, I think the way in which we're funding our campaigns that makes it more possible. But not yet ideal, because Europe is not necessarily the, necessarily the most innovative thinkers about copyright either. This is why what I think what's most important is what's happening in the developing world, in, um, in Brazil or in India, as they become part of this conversation. And so we do need to have a conversation which is international, recognizing you know, the many different interests in this international fight to bring about um, a kind of balance. And um, the extremism of America needs to be checked. And it will only be checked by recognizing this as an international um, international question. This is the critical thing. You know, what's bizarre about copyright is that, you know, we worked for 100 years to harmonize copyright. And we achieved a kind of harmonized regime just at the time the internet comes up. So we achieved a harmonized regime, which was also the wrong regime <laughs> for the internet. But by harmonized, what this means is that we've made it illegal for countries to experiment with differences. So if you now experiment, and have a different kind of copyright protection from what this international TRIPS, organization, uh, trips uh, agreement uh, suggests you should have, you can be found liable. You can be punished through fines for deviating. So just at the moment when we need lots of experimentation, we've locked down this old regime. And so I think we need to recognize that doesn't make sense and push for something that does make sense. And the international forum is, I think, the only place in which it's going to happen. Yeah. One quick, one more question. The first time I contacted it addressed the 20 year old kid comment. So there are lots of 20 year old kids who are interested and engaged want to change stuff. I spent a weekend with 150 of them. You just have to find them and bring them into the center of their conversation. But the question, I think, what can non US citizens do to help better back? Uh, so, what can you do to help Mayday Pack? You can help. Um, spread the idea, that's all. We can't take your support to help elect candidates. And the next stage of Mayday PAC is, is actually gonna be about how do we persuade voters to persuade their existing congressmen to take up the charge. Um, so that, all sorts of help would be incredibly important to that. But your, but your first point, I think, is, is really critical. Um, it's about giving sovereignty back to kids in this debate. You know? And in some sense, bringing more in, it's, it was wonderful to see you the people who stood up who were from that um, generation here, that was an exciting part. It's always been part of this fight. That was Aaron was part of this fight at a very young age. Um, but I think that's the only way we get it. Um, so to educators, I say it's not just about educating us. It's about educating all about the incredible role that you play. Um, so thank you. Thanks very much.